Plessy, as far as the use of power was concerned, the crushing people, attacks on individuals. Um, he was corrupted by all that power and became corrupt, and he couldn't distinguish between his own interests and those of Newfoundland because he thought they were similar. And as far as I'm concerned, relations... Clyde Wells went into Smallwood's cabinet uh, at the same time as Crosby. He knew enough about both of them to tell that there was thunder on the horizon. Crosby was also pretty dedicated and pretty determined that he was going to be Premier of Newfoundland, and he set about trying to achieve that. Newfoundland politics and Joey Smallwood. To understand the career of John Crosby, you have to understand something of this man, Joey Smallwood. Smallwood was the hero of Newfoundland Confederation. He was the province's political boss, virtually unopposed for two decades. He was an electoral wizard and a partisan genius. When Crosby took on Smallwood, he was taking on a legend, a legend with a taste for brass knuckles. It was all rather inevitable. Smallwood liked to own his ministers, and Crosby never thought of himself as anyone's possession. I, I have an independent mind, I believe. In, in, I mean, I'm not going to take dictation from anyone, and I don't go around kissing people's asses uh, to get ahead. I mean, I've always prided myself in that, right? John is an extremely stubborn and opinionated man. I, that's, he's not the only one. Joe Smallwood could feel the same way, too. Edward Roberts is intimate with all the cruel delights of Newfoundland politics. He was there at the time, and from the moment that Smallwood and Crosby met, he knew it was a countdown to the OK Corral, Newfoundland style. I think you had a generational clash between a man who would have been maybe in his 30s, whatever how old John was, 35, and uh, a man in his 60s, one very impatient to get ahead and perhaps prepared to trample uh, on the bodies in the way to get there, and the other equally impatient to stay there and quite prepared to trample those coming up the hill. One of the greatest of Joey's great schemes involved this man, John Shaheen, and his idea for an oil refinery at Combachance. Crosby, with Clyde Wells, abominated the project. They grilled Shaheen in an extraordinary session of the Newfoundland House. I'm asking you a question, whether or not it's a fact. That the this was a unique and ominous occasion. It was defiance, the first deep challenge to Smallwood's power since Confederation. He tried to fire them both. He resigned from the cabinet of Newfoundland on this agreement. They but they resigned the first. Cabinet, it took a lot of nerve, to and it was and going to cost. Don't impute that to me, or I'll tell the Premier just what I said in Cabinet. This wasn't ever a straight political fight. It was a walk through the furnace of Smallwood's imperious rage. The Emperor struck back. Smallwood libeled the entire Crosby family. Contracts for your family's construction company and for your family's insurance company. This is, uh, the attack on his family staggered Crosby, but it also well cleared the decks. It was obvious I mean, I Smallwood had go to go. To Crosby was in no, for the I battle of his that. life. There wasn't anything that he wouldn't attempt, no kind of bullying, no kind of use of improper use of power, threats to people who, uh, who had to deal with the government, people who had brewers, agents, licenses, and so on. It was tyranny. Uh, and Smallwood, was a, by this time, was a despot and his system was tyrannical and of course he uh, he had uh, he'd be informed of what you were doing so there wasn't anything he wouldn't do you couldn't believe a word he said uh, to call what followed a mere leadership convention is like calling a volcano a heat vent this liberal leadership race between crosby and joey was the most explosive tumult in newfoundland since confederation It was inevitable. Smallwood won the vote. But in this grand contest of epic wills, Crosby won the moment. He'd shattered the legend, and he'd proven himself.
Newfoundland politics was forever changed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to wish the Premier well on his victory. I hope he has a successful next two years or whatever it is in his term of office. This was a clash of titanic wills, titanic egos, titanic ambitions. Uh, John had a lot more formal knowledge than uh, Mr. Swalwood ever did in the sense of book learning. And John has a great deal of learning. I'm not sure how much it was knowledge, in fact. <laughs> Mr. Swalwood had a great deal of knowledge. I mean, this is a man who'd, who'd been around, uh, you know, in the political world for 40 years and been all, in all sorts of corners with all yeah. sorts of people. And in my phrase, knew how the game was played uh, behind the net when the ref wasn't looking, you know. And both of them, were, they, they were evenly matched in that sense. And, and it was a, it just, the whole province became entertained by it, transfixed, uh, perhaps traumatized. The other observer participant in all this maelstrom, the great steady pillar in this battle and a hundred lesser ones to come, was Crosby's wife, Jane. You're quite right when you say he's always been in some kind of trouble. But I always felt he could defend himself. And uh, he did, and that's what carried me through. They were not, um, it was difficult years, but it was interesting years. And uh, I would never have been able to weather it, actually, had uh, I not believed in him, and still believed in him, and still do believe in him to the degree I do. John Crosby went into the game at the deep end of the pool, the really deep end. Curiously, at the point when he crossed bludgeons with Smallwood, John Crosby was a very unfinished politician. The war with Joey was his master class in the art of combat politics. He'd enrolled as a liberal, left as a Tory. So um, I learned uh, a lot of, of the realities of politics with Smallwood, and then I learned uh, how to get tough, right? You had to learn quick or you couldn't survive. Uh, I wasn't a good public speaker, uh, so I had to learn public speaking. There's no way you could get in the ring or oppose Smallwood if you weren't able to give some sound bites or engage in a debate or get people interested in listening to you. So you either had to do that or, or get out of politics, you know? So it was a very quick learning process. Be a man, Mr. Smallwood. Here I am, the man you slandered, vilified, attacked buried 18 feet deep, the candidate for the PC party in St. John's West. He may have learned too well. It liberated into its full impetuous glory, one of the great two-edged swords of our time, the untamable Crosby tongue. There was a quantum change in the John Crosby that I went into the house with in 1966 and the John Crosby that became the well-known politician across Canada in the uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, when uh, we were first in the House of Assembly, John was very much an intellectual who put forth reasoned argument in categories and classes, and, and, and I guess to some extent I'm, I'm like that too, uh, but he was often more difficult to follow uh, because of the mannerism. But he recognized that this was a shortcoming in terms of uh, political successes. And he set about trying to deliberately change it. And he did. He made a quantum change in the John Crosby in the way he presented himself. I was going to mention, I wasn't much of a speaker before mm -hmm. this racket started with Mr. Smallwood. I had to become one. And then I got into another, another danger that arose. I got to like speaking too much, right? Like, uh, and, uh, well, uh, you get the, the smell of the grease paint, the roar of the crowd, eh? you get to love that. So uh, you want to entertain the crowd. So every now and then, in speaking to a crowd, you got a good rapport with them, something good going, you'll say something to get you into trouble when it's translated into black and white, uh, such as uh, my famous little uh, pass me the tequila Sheila, you know? It reminds me of a... I don't know whether you've ever heard this old song. It was, pass me the tequila, Sheila. <laughs> and lie down and love me again. I don't know how. <laughs> now, this is just a song. It hasn't happened. Uh... I didn't know the, the CBC was in the damn room. <laughs> Next thing, I was on the national news two nights in a row for the wrong reasons. 
stage two in the odyssey of John Crosby, the switch to federal politics was a bed of roses. He joined the Tories, left the bear pit of Newfoundland politics. Joe Clark, however, tentatively, was prime minister, and here was Crosby, standing in the House of Commons as finance minister. He'd soared to the heights. What could go wrong? Here's to the people of Canada. May they live to survive our initial months. We started off with uh, Joe saying that we were going to act as though we had a majority. Now that was a fatal, fatal miscalculation because, no, I agreed with it at the time, but uh, you know, that's what really got us into trouble because it gave us the impression that we're the hell with the Liberals, right? If there's another election, we've cleaned their clocks anyway, the Canadian public are fed up with them. The Honourable Minister Canal. What could go wrong? Well, he could bring down the budget, and the budget could bring down Clark's government. The Liberals forced a vote, poor Clark wasn't ready, and after being out for so long and in for so little, the Tories were, yes, out again. They were devastated. Crosby must have thought he was cursed. Crosby's budget brought into play thereby the sequence that led Joe Clark to put the Tory leadership up for grabs. Consider, he was a freshman MP, his budget was the occasion of the Tory defeat, he barely showed up in leadership polls, yet Crosby decides to run for leadership and gather some of the best campaign organizers around, veteran John Lassinger. The promise I made to him was that we would uh, uh, we would support him. He wouldn't lose it because of organization. Lashinger was right. Crosby and his team surprised everybody. Against Clark and Mulroney, he was real competition. Organization wouldn't be Crosby's downfall. Never was. What took the spokes out of Crosby's campaign, the wheels off the bus, wasn't a blow from the other contenders. It was that ungovernable tongue. This moment, he's being questioned about his non-French in Montreal, is the central pivot of his entire career. No, well, I cannot talk to the Chinese people in their own language either. I can't talk to the German people in their own language. Does that mean that there should be no relationships between Canada and China, or Canada and, and uh, Germany, or whatever? Surely, to heavens. Uh, you're, if it, what you're saying is correct, the world would be in desperate shape. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a good answer from a diplomatic or politically sensitive point of view. I mean, I thought the remark made perfect sense, but it gave everyone who's after me about French a chance to pound me out, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in the Quebec, they said, oh, what's he saying? That Chinese is just as good as French, or German is just as good as French. So I really, that was really, uh, I was on a high up to that time, and that uh, caused me a severe problem just as we were approaching the convention. I mean, it stopped our momentum dead. Like Crosby himself, campaign manager John Lashinger has had time to reflect on the cost of that epic gaff. Well, you have a little chill go through your body, <laughs> for starters. Um, we had been very, you know, he, John gets gets bored, uh, and that's what, and he gets bored with he's with when he's faced with the same thing, and if he has to say the same thing, he likes to say things differently. And when politicians get into that, they tend to get into trouble sometimes. Je suis Canadien et je suis fier. But credit where credit is due. Crosby has the resilience of an industrial strength trampoline. The Montreal incident would have scuppered any ordinary politician. Going into the convention against the smooth charm of Mulroney, on the tailwind of that gas, he knew his chances were on low stall and headed for Earth. But desperate times call for extreme performance. He went on to deliver to the convention what many believe to be the finest speech of his life. I have met, I have met and overcome many challenges in my lifetime. It will be a pleasure, un pleasure, to overcome this challenge. I shall overcome.